Okay, so here is the next installment of the Physics 232 videos. Um, this will be, I think, the last video about uh, our nonlinear fits. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to just discuss in a little more detail how you might actually make the search for your fit parameters more efficient. To this point, we've imagined just doing something very simple, set up a grid and just calculate chi-squared at a whole bunch of grid points. And then we look at the list of values and pick the one that's the smallest. Um, of course, there's better ways of doing it. And, and I don't know in detail exactly how software searches for the minimum of chi-squared in a nonlinear fit. Um, so these are just more than being like a rigorous set of notes on how it's actually done. I just want to present some ideas on what you might do, some approaches that you might take. And so what I want to talk about is possibly doing a gradient search. And so the motivation is to find a better way to determine the best fit parameters of a nonlinear model. So we have some nonlinear function and some data and so there's some parameters in that function that you're trying to determine from the data. So this grid method that we've been talking about requires many calculations of chi-squared to find the minimum. In our discussions, we've been kind of imagining two parameter fits. And in that case, you know, you could easily in software calculate chi-squared many, many times, and it's no problem. Uh, but if you had a more complicated model with many parameters, this, this might start to be computationally expensive. So what we want to do is we want to locate the minimum of chi-squared more efficiently. So let's, let's do an example. Um, and again, I, I'm going to do the two parameter fit because it makes it doable to draw some of the pictures that I want to draw. So a two parameter fit to determine A1 and A2. Okay, so chi squared we would calculate from our n measurements the deviation. And so our calculated value of y would depend on our two parameters as well as the value of x. And then we divide by sigma and we square it and then we add them all up. So really what that means is that the chi-squared is, of course, a function of the parameters. So if we make different choices for the different parameters, we change the value of chi-squared. What we could do is we could construct a contour plot. So we could make a contour plot. And so if you happen to be in physics 216, then we've we drew some of these contour plots just before switching to these online online classes. So um, what that might look like is we make one of our axes the A2 axis and one of them the A1 axis. And these contours are going to be lines of constant 
chi-squared values. And so maybe it looks something like this. So these are lines of constant chi-squared. OK, now if we were doing a grid method, what we would do is we would have an A1 minimum, and we would have an A1 maximum, and we'd have a step size. And so let's pick a step size here, something like this. Okay, I didn't draw them perfectly equally spaced, um, but let's imagine they were equally spaced. And then I would also have an A2 minimum, and I'd have an A2 max. And again, we would have a step size. And again, what we would do is we would calculate chi-squared at all the intersections. And let's imagine that these lines over here, this is where the true, this is the true minimum of chi-squared. So these lines out here are constant contours of large chi-squared. And then over here, these are contours where chi-squared is small. OK, so if we actually did our grid method, this is what we would select as the one giving us the smallest chi-squared value. And we would come up with like an A1 star best fit value over here and an A2 star over here. All right, so the question is, how does this gradient method work? Well, what the gradient tells you is the direction of steepest increase of a function. So if you think of a contour map where it's like the elevation of on a, on a map, a top of, so a, a map that tells you elevation as a function of position, then what the gradient of a map like that would do is it would point up the direction of steepest increase. So the steepest slope up some hill or something like that. Okay, so the gradient search approach is to follow the path of steepest descent from a starting point. So if the gradient tells us the steepest increase, what we're going to do is we're going to find that direction and we're going to move in parameter space in the opposite direction. So we're going to start from a starting point and we're going to go in the direction of steepest descent to locate the minimum. OK, so if we recreate our plot here, A1 and A2, and then we have our contours, something like this. What we might do is we might have a starting point over here. And so we're going to have to provide whatever program we write some initial value. And so we're going to say that that's A10 and A20. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're at our starting point, and then we calculate gradients 
gradients of chi-squared with respect to the parameters a1 and a2. And take steps. Let, let's say we're going we're gonna to take small steps. We'll take small steps in the direction of steepest descent. Um, every time we take a step, what we'll do is we'll recalculate the gradient. So after each step, we recalculate recalculate the gradient in order to refine the path to the minimum. All right. So what we might do is we might say, okay, we start here, and then what we find is that we're going to calculate the gradient of chi squared, and we're going to go in the negative direction. So remember, the gradient is always perpendicular to these contours of constant, um, of constant chi squared in this case, and so. If we calculate that gradient, then maybe we decide to take a step. Oh, that would be a1, wouldn't it? We're going to take a step like this in the a1 direction and a step like this in the a2 direction. Oh, sorry, I need to. Step is going to be delta a2. And then we recalculate the gradient. And we take a new step, and then we recalculate again, and then again, and we keep recalculating the gradient until we reach our minimum point. One possible pitfall with this method is that if you don't make a good choice for a starting point, if you have a very complicated nonlinear function that you're fitting to, what can happen is you can get trapped in local minima of chi squared. So in order for this method to work well, we need to have a good starting point where we would have uh, so our starting point is a10, a20. Otherwise, we risk getting caught in a local minimum. So let me try to draw a picture of what that could look like. We'll do the simplest case, um, just a one parameter fit. So example, in a one parameter fit, chi squared would be a function of just a single parameter. But it's possible that that's a relatively complicated function of a single parameter. And maybe what it looks like is something like this. And so I'm going to label a few points here, A, B, C, D, and E. So over here at D, that's uh, what we might call a local minimum in chi-squared. And over here at A, um, this would be the global or true minimum value or true 
minimum of chi squared. So if we imagined starting our gradient search from either a point A or a point B, what the search is going to do is it's going to direct us down towards point D and we'll never get out of that local minimum. So if we start a gradient search at A or B, we will we will descend into the local minimum at D. In other words, we'll never find the true minimum at E. A search that starts at C, a search that starts at C will locate the global minimum at point E. Okay, um, and so if you had a complicated fit to do, there may be actually some value to combining a grid search with a gradient search. Maybe you use a coarse grid search to kind of map out where you think all the local minima are, and then you could do gradient searches from all those starting points where you think all the minima are, and you let your gradient search find all of the local minima, and one of them is going to be the true global minimum. And so maybe some kind of some kind of combination, some clever combination of these two methods might be a good strategy when you have a complicated situation. Okay, so how would you, how would you implement something like this? So let's consider, I'm going to define the gradient of chi-squared where the gradient is with respect to the fit parameters. So I have a little subscript A here, so to indicate that these are derivatives with respect to the fit parameters, where the gradient of A is equal to d by dA1, a1 hat, plus d by dA2, a2 hat, plus, and so on, if it's an m parameter fit, We go to the mth parameter. Okay, so chi squared, if we take the gradient, then that's equal to d chi squared da1 a1 hat plus d chi squared da2 a2 hat plus and so on plus d chi squared dam am hat. Okay, let's let's try an example. A two parameter case where let's we previously worked with this situation where we had some amplitude sine of a two x, so our amplitude is a one. Okay, so chi squared is gonna be y i minus a one sine a two x i over sigma i squared. Okay, so d chi squared d a one. This is also we've also done this calculation before. We get minus two the sum of what? So we would get y i minus a1 sine a2 xi over sigma i. So that handles the square. And then by chain rule, we take the a1 derivative of what's inside. And we would get a sine 
a two x i over sigma i. There would be a minus sign, but I've already put that out front. Okay, and then if we did it with respect to a two, we would get minus two times the sum of, uh, so the first factor is the same. And then we take the a2 derivative. So the sign's going to become cos. We'll get an xi out front. Um, there's a minus sign that we've already put out front. So it's a1 xi cos a2 xi over sigma i. And so then our gradient would be the following. We would just take these two partial derivatives, multiply them by unit vectors, one in the a1 direction and one in the a2 direction. Um, but if you think about this a little bit, this is a slightly odd function because what we have is a function y of a1, a2, where the parameters a1 and a2 don't have the same units. So that means this derivative of chi-squared chi is unitless. So the derivative of chi-squared with respect to a1 has units of 1 over a1. The derivative of chi squared with respect to a2 has the units of the inverse of a2. So if you think about this expression, it is a little odd. example, if y is, say, a vertical position so that it has units of length and x is a horizontal position so that x also has units of length, then if we go back to our function, a1 would have to have units of y, whatever y is, which is a length. The argument of the sine, a2 times x, has to be unitless. So if x is length, then a2 is inverse length. So then in the expression y is a1 sine a2x, we would require a1 to be a length and a2 to be 1 over length. So that means the units of chi-squared derivative with respect to a1, a1 is a length, so this has units of 1 over length, and the derivative of chi-squared with respect to a2 has units of 1 over the units of a2, which is a length. So that means the terms in this gradient that we defined don't have the same units. That is, it's not easy to directly compare
the partial derivatives in the two terms of our gradient. Okay, so how are we going to resolve this issue? What we might think of doing is defining some dimensionless parameters. So we're going to scale A1 so that it's dimensionless, and we're going to scale A2 so that it's dimensionless. So let's define B1 is A1 over delta A1, and B2 is A2 over delta A2, where delta A1 and delta A2 are step sizes we're going to take when we're doing our search. So what we're really going to try to do is we're going to try to use the gradient to determine which direction we should step in. And once we figure that direction out, maybe we say, okay, our step size is going to be kind of something to do with delta A1 in the A1 direction and delta A2 in the A2 direction. Okay, so with this definition, the B1 and B2 are unitless. So in this case, uh, the units of B1 is equal to the units of B2, and they're just unitless. The units are, say, one unitless. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about, then, if we took the partial derivative of chi squared with respect to B1, and chi squared depends on A1, then by chain rule, this is the derivative of chi squared with respect to a1 times the derivative of a1 with respect to b1. And for our example, we already know the derivative of chi squared with respect to a1. Um, so now a1 is equal to, from this, is delta a1 times b1 is delta a1 times b1. So this derivative is just delta a1. OK, so then d chi squared db1 is going to be equal to d chi squared da1 delta a1. And so this is unitless. The partial derivatives has the units of the inverse of the whatever a1 units are, but then we multiply by delta a1, so that cancels that. And so likewise, we would say the derivative of chi squared with respect to b2 would be d chi squared da2 delta a2. OK. So this allows us to evaluate a new gradient, evaluate, say the gradient of chi squared with respect to the B parameters. which would be defined in this way. It's the derivative with respect to B1 in the B1 direction, and the derivative of chi squared with respect to B2 in the B2 direction, where since B1 is just a scaled version of A1, these unit vectors have the, are, are the same. Okay, and so in terms then of the A parameters, this gradient then is the following.
so just reiterating these are both unitless and therefore easy to compare to one another. So we could say if one of those quantities is large compared to the other one, then we would it would be in our benefit to take the step in the direction of the large quantity. So to get the direction of the required step, right, we're trying to take a step in the direction of steepest decrease of the required step, what we would do is evaluate, let's define a unit vector gamma hat, where it's going to be this gradient with respect to the B. And if we're going to make a unit vector, we could just divide that by the magnitude of the gradient with respect to B. And that is just going to be equal to d chi squared dA1 delta A1 A1 hat plus d chi squared dA2 delta A2 A2 hat divided by the terms in the numerator squared and added. And then take the square root in the end. Okay, so where the way that we get the magnitude of the gradient of chi squared, the square of that magnitude would just be taking the dot product of the vector with itself. Which is just what's under the square root in the expression above. So gamma hat is a unit vector in the direction of steepest increase of chi squared for the gradient search method we would step in we would step in the direction of minus gamma hat, would step in the direction of minus gamma hat. Okay, so we take the step that we're gonna take in the direction of minus uh, gamma hat, and then we would recalculate the gradient of chi squared with respect to b, and then we would update gamma hat. We would find the new unit vector that's in the direction of steepest increase, and we'd go in the opposite direction. And we'd take these small steps over and over, and after every step, we calculate gamma hat. So the method is to one, is to pick a starting point. Say A10, A20. Two is to calculate gamma hat and step in the direction of minus gamma hat. Three is to recalculate gamma hat and take another 
step in minus gamma hat direction. The step three, we're going to do over and over and over again until we reach some kind of criterion that we have to set it ahead of time that tells us when to stop. So four is to check the stopping criteria. Criterion. And so there's two possibilities. One possibility is if we don't stop, return to three. If we do stop, then we just end. OK, so what are some possible criterion to stop the search? So possible criterion to stop the search. Uh, so this might include things like uh, that the magnitude of this gradient that we calculate becomes really small, below some threshold value. If it's really small, that means that the chi-squared surface is very flat. It's not steep at all. And maybe we decide we're at a sufficiently flat region where taking steps doesn't really get us much gain in reducing the chi-squared anymore. So this magnitude of this gradient falls below some predetermined threshold value. I.e. chi-squared is sufficiently flat. Another thing that might happen is if you plot chi-squared as a function of a certain parameter and you're sitting over here at point one and then you take a step and so maybe this is a1 and then this is a1 plus some step that you take and what you find is that chi-squared increases and so then you're going to take another step backwards and maybe what you find is that you just oscillate between two points where the or maybe you oscillate between some over across some minimum right so Next time you step back, you're over here, and then you step over here, and you find that you're not actually approaching this minimum, that your, your values of A are just oscillating back and forth. So a second criterion could be that more steps cause chi-squared to either increase or to oscillate about a minimum. I mean, if this is the second criteria is what you find, then you may consider whether or not you want to reduce the size of your steps. But I think these are two possibilities. So as again, I don't want you to take this as like some gospel on, on how nonlinear fits are truly done, but it's just some ideas, some approaches that you might consider if you wanted to do something more sophisticated than just setting up a grid and blindly calculating a bunch of chi-squared values. All right, perfect. So um, that's it for this video. Uh, I believe that the next thing we're gonna do is we're, we're kind of done talking about our fitting. We've done, uh, we did lin linear fits, we did fits to models that are of the form of the sum of AK 
times fk of x, where k is 1 to m. And now we've talked about some features of nonlinear fits. Uh, the only thing that I've got left in Physics 232 is, is maybe just a brief introduction into some Monte Carlo methods. And so what is Monte Carlo? How could it be used to do useful things? Well, the primary thing that we'll talk about is how we might use a Monte Carlo simulation to evaluate numerically some integrals that we can't solve analytically. Um, and then we may discuss how you could use Monte Carlo to do more than just solve a math problem, but could you, could you use it to gain insight into the behavior of some kind of physical system? All right, so that's where we'll leave it. Uh, thanks very much.